So hello everyone and thank you for joining today. Um, I'm Esperanza, the community manager of Focal Plane, uh, which is the microscopy community site hosted by the Journal of Cell Science. Um, if you haven't heard about us, um, we created Focal Plane for you to connect with like-minded people and also find resources and information uh, relating to microscopy. So in our site, you can find, for example, news, interviews, uh, posts, uh, discussing tools or protocols, uh, job listings, a calendar of events. Um, our community site is free to access and you just need to create an account in order to start posting your own contributions. So please check our site and join our community. Back to today's speaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Pavel Tomanchak. He is a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, Germany, and he's been also recently appointed as director of the SciTech Consortium in the Czech Republic. Um, his research focuses on animal development using an interdisciplinary approach combining biology, physics, microscopy, and image analysis to study patterns of gene expression uh, in animal development. Um, but not only that, he's been also a great advocate of open access, creating resources such as OpenSpeam, which we might hear today, and also image analysis software like Fiji, which I'm sure that most of you use. Um, so when we started planning focal plane features, um, we wanted to invite speakers who have been making great contributions um, to the field of microscopy. So either on technology development or in cell biology or in bioimage analysis. And as you can see, Pavel's scientific trajectory covers all of these fields. Um, so we were really excited um, to see that he accepted our invitation. So thank you, Pavel, for joining us today. And we look forward to hear your presentation. Microscopy is because of this arrangement, how the sample is actually mounted. So in particular in SPIM, it is mounted in a very unusual way. It is not on a cover slip. It is embedded in some kind of a semi-solid gel, for example, agarose. It is included in a capillary. It is suspended by, by gravity in front of the lens, or it could be sticking out from, from below. You somehow create some kind of a plunger system to, to push this agarose column outside of the capillaries so that it is immersed in the chamber where the imaging is basically happening so that there is no, uh, there is, there is no additional glass water e e interface and you enter the light sheet from, from the side into the specimen. What is important is also to notice is that the, the imaging in SPIM is typically happening in aqueous solution in water and that kind of provides for many specimens the ra right environment. Now this arrangement, this way how the specimen is actually ma mounted for light sheet microscopy gives us additional degree of, of freedom which is illustrated here in the middle of this schematic by an arrow which is cer cer circular. This means that we have the ability to rotate the specimen in front of the detection lens. I have a little animation here where two drosophila embryos embedded in the agarose are rotated in front of the specimen. During imaging, this is not happening. We are kind of, we, 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 we will rotate the specimen, take, take the, the series of two-dimensional optical sections to gain a three-dimensional image stack, and then we will rotate the specimen again by, let's say, 45 degrees and scan it from another angle. Which means that for if in, in, in SPIM, we will get multiple different views of the same specimen from different angles. And this is really a fundamental difference to um, other types of microscopy. And in SPIM, it is usually referred to as a multi-view microscopy. Uh, technology the developers of SPIM have been uh, kind of you know, playing with this concept of being able to look at the same specimen from different angles in various yes. ways. The original design by Jan, by Jan Husken was simply trying to physically position the detection axis around the specimen. And this turned out to be very difficult to manage because it's hard to put a specimen in the middle of these ob objectives. Then he came up with this really ingenious design where the detection and the, uh, and the, and the illumination axis are arranged per perpendicularly the specimen is mounted in the agarose, in the capillary, and is rotated in front of the detection axis 
in the place where the light sheet can scan it. Now, it has its disadvantages because the signal deteriorates from le left to right as, it, as the light sheet enters. And this can be um, compensated by providing the, the illumination from another side. And then finally, in the kind of spin world, you know, the, the pinnacle of, of development has been the re, 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 realization that one can also add another detection axis, which essentially means that you can illuminate from two sides and detect from two sides, which essentially provides you with an opportunity to image the specimen from, from kind of from different angles without having to rotate it. But nevertheless, the rotation still remains as an option, and in many of the microscopes it is e implemented because it is still useful even when you are illuminating the specimen from two sides and, and detecting the fluorescence from, from, from two sides, to still rotate it because you can then sample uh, the specimen from a different direction, and that has many, many benefits. Okay, so using these kind of technologies, um, uh, you know, the, the 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 people who have been doing technology development in in light sheet have really actually captured uh, our imaginations of sci scientists, and I think of everyone, by being able to capture, um, for example, animal development with exquisite details with ability to follow most if not all the cells in the developing system being able to image the developing system sufficiently fast so that one can actually really observe the behavior of the cells and to um, and to uh, and and all that with with uh, with with the ability to image the specimen for extremely long long time, meaning that the, that that the specimen is actually able to survive all this imaging. What I'm looking at here is the complete development of Drosophila, captured by two different groups, two two, two different microscopes which are following uh, similar, let's say, principles, and. And it really is something which, which uh, you know, inspired a lot of people to actually start looking into this kind of uh, microscopy uh, technology. Very soon, this microscopy technology became available to essentially everyone through a commercial realization of a similar principle. Zeiss uh, brought uh, to the market the, the microscope, which is called Lightsheet Z Z1, which uh, implements the dual-sided illumination and single-sided detection together with the rotation. And I'm showing here a, a movie which we, we, we captured in our la laboratory. This is a Drosophila embryo, which is expressing histone in every single cell. We are imaging it from five different views every 1.5 minutes, 1.2 minutes. I don't see it because there is some graphics all, all over it. Um, so we can, we can really, the, the embryo, embryo is rotating, but this is only visualization. We are trying to show here that we are imaging it essentially in totality. At some point, the embryo starts essentially living, and we are imaging it for more than 20 hours, and it completely survives the process. It simply crawls out. The price we, we, we pay for this is that we collect a huge amount of data, 4.1 terabytes of raw image data. There is another possibility how one can actually kind of get a taste of this technology. One can also try to build it yourself. So this is one of the contributions which my laboratory and together with Jan, Jan Huskens have made to this uh, kind of field where we developed a do-it-yourself light sheet microscope, which we call Open SPIM. There is a website where you can uh, find out what parts you need, need for it, and there is step-by-step -step assembly of how to put it together. When you manage to put together such a microscope, you can essentially capture similar movies, but of course it has its limitation. It is not uh, by far as fast as the microscopes which we have been looking at before, either the commercial or the uh, technology development, uh, and or the microscope coming out of the technology de 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 development labs. But it's a very good uh, platform to evaluate whether this particular technology could be useful for the types of questions which uh, you might wa want, want to ask. Now, unfortunately, I already mentioned this. Uh, there is always there is no free lunch. There is always a price to pay. And in SPIM, it is the you know we 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 get beautiful views into dynamic, particular developmental events, but uh, we have to deal with uh, enormous amount of image data. 
Processing and post processing. This is kind of over, over the years developed into a field of SPIM or SPIMage processing. And, and just to give an overview, no matter which microscope, which SPIM microscope you use, you will eventually face uh, the challenges of having to register, put together the different views of the same specimen into one, uh, into one let's say, reference frame. You, since you are collecting four different stacks, you have to then, in order to create one output image, when it is registered, you have to combine it. And this is known in the SPIM as a fusion, which can be achieved also by deconvolution. And even when you do that and you crop the image, you still end up with a very large amount of image data, which will kind of tax your abilities to, to visualize it even, because, because it's really difficult to fit it into memory over a over, over reasonable analysis of such la large large data you also have to somehow either search for a solution or 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 think about developing something particular which is able to scale to this kind of large large data sets so so my laboratory has contributed quite a lot to solving these kind of problems we for example solve the registration problem by by changing here essentially the, the approach not trying to register the views using the the data of the specimen itself. We are looking again here at the maximum intensity projection of Drosophila embryo embedded in, in uh, agarose. But what we did, we included in the agarose, which is a rigid medium, sub-resolution fluorescent beads, which look here like a little starry, starry uh, night. And we are using these beads as a fiduciary markers to achieve the registration. I will not go into the details here. I just show you a little visual, visualization, which shows that this works actually beautifully. Believe it or not, what you are looking at here is also a Drosophila embryo. I am showing a lot of Drosophila embryos in this in this presentation, and uh, what you what you essentially have is now an embryo which has been imaged from many different angles, and the information about these angles have been completely lost. And these red dots here are showing how how far the the, the same fluorescent beads are from where they are supposed to be. And when we run uh, our re registration pipeline, we see that the fluorescent beads, they, they, they change in color, meaning that they become closer and closer to where they need, need to be. And when they are completely green, it means that they overlap. And then as a free lunch here, you actually get the registered specimen. This happens within half a second. This is here just slow down so that it can be visualized. So this is essentially a solved, solved problem, which you can use this for essentially any specimen where you have a possibility to embed, in it, embed it in agarose and include the fluorescent beads as the fiduciaries. However, some people might not really want to have the fiduciaries around the specimen. And that's why this approach is also extendable to, uh, uh, let's say, markers inside the specimen which are resembling fluorescent beads. And so, for example, here we are looking at the reconstruction of a zebrafish e embryo, which is achieved by matching, um, instead of fluorescent beads, by matching constellations of nuclei inside the specimen. So if your specimen has labeled nuclei, they can be approximated in some way as fluorescent beads, and our algorithms can be used to reconstruct the specimen. This is, again, a completely unguided process, which, you know, in most cases actually works. So um, that's that's registration. Now I want to show you one glimpse of what deconvolution does to, to the data. Deconvolution here is viewed as a, as a way how to fuse the data. Once again, you are looking here at C. Uh, elegans uh, embryo, which has been imaged from many different angles. And these blurry data are the data which are coming out of the microscope. In, in fact, if you look at the second row, the data which look the worst, this is actually uh, data which have not been really, this is viewed from the angle which was never captured by the microscope. And now if you, if you combine all these views by a process, very computationally demanding process of the deconvolution, in the second row of each blurry image, you see how dramatically you can actually improve the quality, the contrast, and the resolution of, of this image. So this is something which is worthwhile doing. However, one has to say that this is a very computationally costly process. It will take a while, and you will need a powerful computer to actually achieve it. Um, so um, now, when, when you have the data together, 
I mentioned already that you have to actually invest in, in, in new ways how to interact with it because the data are really big. We are talking here about terabytes. So for that, we developed an approach which is called the Big Data Viewer, which really kind of is, 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 is geared around large data and which really allows you to seamlessly navigate almost, uh, let's say, unbounded, infinitely large uh, image data sets. Here I'm showing here a snippet from a very long vi video which shows how one can interact with uh, the light sheet data in the big data viewer. But what I want to kind of stress here is that the development which was inspired here by the needs of light sheet mi microscopy, by the fact that light sheet microscopy really generates, you know, unprecedentedly large data sets has inspired development in computer science to really um, make uh, visualization of, 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 of data efficient so that it scales to the largest data sets. And so the same framework can be, can be used to view, for example, electron microscopy data, which have hundreds of terabytes in, uh, in volume. And so this is really kind of good, let's say, um, side effect of the development which we did for light sheet microscopy because this uh, data visualization framework is really some, uh, something which, which scales to the largest uh, available uh, microscopy data sets. Okay, so if even when you do all these kind of tricks, you will often face the fact that your data are too big to be processed on a single computer. And that's why we also invested quite a lot of effort to parallelize the processing of the light sheet data. This schematic is very understand. It just essentially uh, we have developed pipelines which allow you to, to spread the, the, the heavy tasks of processing uh, long-term time lapses to split them tri trivially into time points and process them in parallel on a cluster computer. This can be done either from the command line for somebody who is ver well versed with uh, running a cluster computer, or we have also developed a graphical user interface which allows it to al allows you to uh, achieve this from within uh, a program which you might be uh, familiar with. Finally, I mean this slide maybe I should have skipped, but but this slide shows you know what kind of uh, what kind of effort one has to really invest in analyzing this type of light sheet data. So what, what you are seeing here on the left, left side are the mu multiple views of a, of a light sheet uh, a data set where uh, computers or people have been tracking cells and these data are visualized in 3D and are then also represented as a, as a lineage view of how the cells are related in, in development. And so we have developed over the years uh, together with collaborators um, kind of increasingly larger and more complex tools to, to segment and track cells in these large multi-view light sheet data sets. The, the, the platforms are called uh, TrackMate, Mammoth, and Mastodon. And what you should remember here is that you know the thing which you should use is Mastodon because that's the most advanced uh, um, platform which scales to millions and millions of cells and which allows you, as is shown on the low, lower part of the panel, also to perform uh, advanced 3D visu visualization of the raw as well as the track data and to, for example, uh, compare the lineages from multiple specimens in kind of same virtual reality world, which is powered by pro program or by a plugin which is called the so Actually, kind of, you know, leads me to Maybe uh, you know first, let's say uh, conclusion of my talk, and I think I will run out of time really badly. Which which is that what I have been showing is essentially you know how light sheet microscopy has been actually inspiring new developments in biological image analysis, and what I think you know is maybe not so uh, realized in the community is that uh, in particular in my group, I mean all this has been always developed. Um, uh, under the Fiji platform. In fact, the, the emergence and the kind of, you know, the support and development of the Fiji platform, particularly from, uh, from Dresden, has been always motivated by the need to develop new, more advanced solutions for light sheet microscopy. And so in some way, 
Fiji has now become a really ubiquitous in the wide variety of fields of life sciences and beyond for various tasks in image data analysis. But really, the, the one of the reasons why it even exists is that uh, it has been really um, kind of embraced as a platform for uh, performing this kind of very advanced and demanding tasks in light sheet image data analysis. So that that's a little little let's say side side effect of of doing uh, research in this area. Um, Another thing which which we which I which which uh, me and uh, my colleagues in particular Emmanuel Re Reynaud, who will be on the next couple of slides there will be always a picture of him in the right right side have invested in was is to somehow uh, organize the network the light sheet community we have organized uh, I think until now something like eleven uh, or not we but many other people but we started organizing. Uh, a light sheet microscopy uh, fluorescent workshop, which then later on evolved into a conference. And so, you know, if you see this happening, you know, I really invite you to to go there because because there you will get a really good overview of what is new in the light sheet mi microscopy field. And together with uh, Emmanuel Re 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 Reno once again, and with Jan Jan, Jan Pe Pechel, we have actually invested a lot of effort and had a fantastic fun organizing practical courses on light sheet ma microscopy where we really brought together all the many of the leaders of this field and many different setups to Dresden and had a you know fantastic two week intense events of imaging whatever the students have brought brought to us. We have made I have made uh, several mistakes in my life and one of them was this when I actually one year uh, attempted to organize both things together. So the light sheet course followed immediately by the light sheet conference. And I absolutely do not recommend this to anyone because it's a little bit too much to do. Nevertheless, it was also uh, super fun. So now, wait a minute, right? So I have been kind of uh, make, giving a little bit of an overview how I got fascinated with light sheet mic mi microscopy and how uh, together with uh, particularly with computer scientists, we have uh, kind of invested into making it uh, more available to the uh, scientific community. So, but now the question, you know, which I actually posed in my abstract was, you know, what is it good for? And that actually is in a sense, a uh, little bit, I mean, now, until now I have absolutely not provided answer to that, to that question because Microscopy from the very beginning has been used to demonstrate the ability of the technology uh, to, to, to show showcase what it can do, but only in recent years has it become actually a tool to answer scientific questions. And so I would like to in the rest of my presentation, which maybe is actually going to be cut short a little bit, I would like to give you a glimpse of what one can actually really practically do with light sheet microscopy in order to answer questions which were maybe inaccessible without this particular uh, tech technology. And in fact, you know, it will be a little bit, uh, you know, even more specific because I think that in particular SPIM, I should actually really talk more about SPIM than about light sheet mi mi microscopy. I, I see that the SPIM has a major impact on one particular field, and that is the field of 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 more of of tissue morphogenesis. So, as we all know, in multicellular life is extremely good at creating shapes, and we see this be beautifully on, on those movies uh, shown here for three different realms of life: for animals, fungi, and plants. In fact, the top movie is captured with a light sheet. And of course, morphogenesis is a prop process where, where cells act in concert to create forms, and in particular, animals are extremely good at this. I like to show this on an animal which is, you know, known to you perhaps as a as a delicacy, which is a crustacean. Crustaceans they have a specialized appendage on every uh, segment of their body. That appendage is specialized in in, in its function. And the function comes, of course, from its specialized shape. A shape emerges in the process of development. And here, light sheet microscopy 
instrumental. It's a fantastic technique to capture the development of that. So what you will be looking at here is a 10,000 times sped up development of a crustacean. This crustacean has been imaged by uh, Tassos uh, pa Pavlopoulos for about four and a half days. And as we run the movie, we see the beautiful dance of the cells. At some point, we start seeing a little butts. I will now start zooming into the movie, and we really see now the spectacle of tissue morphogenesis unraveling in front of our eyes. The cells are dividing in a certain direction. They are moving with respect to each other. They are creating the shapes of the appendages, of the specialized ap uh, appendages of this, of this crustacean. So, so this is really beautiful, right? I mean, as you notice, we have for the first time moved outside of Drosophila. We are starting to look now at something which is an animal where we don't really know much about. In Drosophila, we know essentially everything about what, what cell morphogenesis lo looks like, and we are looking very deeply in the mechanisms. In these systems, we don't know much. What is really great, I think, is that, that these systems, which are not established model systems, they are actually quite accessible to light sheet microscopy, because, or particularly SPIM, because SPIM is good at looking at the animal in its totality and visualizing it at the level of the behavior of behavior of cells. And in fact, in order to get some kind of fluorescent marker into almost any animal, you can use a very simple technique. You can you can, you can fuse some kind of a cytoskeletal molecule, such as actin or a membrane marker or myosin or a nuclear marker to a fluorescent protein, and you can inject it in the early stage of that animal, and you will immediately, without doing any transgenics, which might be impossible in many species, you will immediately be able to visualize the, 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 the shapes of the cells and the, and the molecules which are relevant for generating, let's say, uh, forces inside of of those cells. So here I think there's really an opportunity of the convergence of the two techniques being able to, to, to mark the, the, the effectors of more morphogenesis and look at them using light sheet ma microscopy. And we were really able to, 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 to kind of show in two short stories how this can have impact. So what we have, for example, together with Stefan Grill, be able to show that in the case of gastroation of a flower beetle, which is a insect different from from drosophila there is a asymmetric flow of the tissue during gastration and physical modeling indicated to us that um, the only um, explanation how this asymmetric tissue flow can come about is that the tissue has to be attached to some external reference frame in this case we have established that the tissue is a very specifically in a specific place anchored to the external shell which surrounds the embryo. We've been able to show that this is uh, mediated by integrins. And then when we looked at the established model system, uh, Drosophila, we found that in fact, the integrin mediated attachment of the gastroating uh, embryo of the, of the blastoderm cells to the, to the external reference frame of the shell which surrounds it is necessary to for proper proper imagination of the kind of posterior end of that animal now if we compare that with the situation in the beetle we see here also that the tissue uh, in the place where it is attached to the vitamin envelope which you can see see here on this on on this movie basically uh, buckles up and that indicates that this uh, attachment creates a barrier against which the tissue can actually buckle. So this is a very, you know, nice demonstration of uh, of a force, which, 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 which supplements the physical force, which uh, which is known to drive tissue buckling, which is the force which is generated internally in the tissue, is a force which comes from the localized interaction of the tissue with the external reference frame, with the with the inner surface of the of the eggshell in which the embryo is is developing. So it, it, it indicates that there is a interplay between the tissue intrinsic and tissue extrinsic forces 
for proper gastration. But in the context of, of, of this talk, you know, how were we able to actually show it? Well, in fact, at the very beginning of all this has been light sheet microscopy movie. So which you can see here on the top part of that movie, this is a, this is a triborium a, 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 em, embryo, which has been injected with a myosin, which is the effector of tissue morphogenesis of cell shape changes. And, what, and we have been imaging it from different angles, reconstructing it using all the technologies which I described in the first you know, half of, of my talk. And what you notice here is that in the system, there is a fundamental asymmetry where the embryonic part upregulates myosin, whereas the extra embryonic part down, down regulates it. And this generates this asymmetric flow, which we then showed is, uh, is required to it requires the anchoring at, at, at a particular place to the vitellin envelope. So now, you know, what, what I wanted to really highlight here is that this, this light sheet movie, which captures the entire development of the triborium tri in total from different angles, in fact, has, you know, not been in its, in its ent entirety used to support the, the conclusion of of the paper which we wrote together with the physicists because they were unable to apply their theoretical modeling to all this data. They had to dimensionally reduce it, they had to focus on the on the sarcoid cross section of the embryo, which is shown on the second movie. Then they unfurl it into a one-dimensional line and they make a chymograph, which provides the input for uh, essentially the physical modeling. But but I mean the point here is that without the ability to look at that embryo from all the angles and being able to cleanly extract the myosin dis the distribution around the circumference of the embryo work would, would not be possible. And, and in, interestingly, you know, I've been kind of working for 10 years building up the various techno technical aspects of light sheet uh, technology, but in the paper where this technology has been really instrumental the technology was not mentioned. It was actually not mentioned in the main text of the paper. There was, it was just said that we imaged the embryo and in the materials and methods we wrote that we imaged it with light sheet microscopy and that we did multi-view reconstruction and we did all these dances for which we really developed the right uh, technology. And this to me is a very good sign of how to use this technology. It's a sign of maturity of the technology because it becomes a tool to answer biological questions as opposed to being simply, uh, uh, let's say, a goal of its own, of the technology development. Okay, so um, I don't know, how much time do I, do I have? Uh, like three more minutes, three, four more minutes. Yeah, okay, 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 good. So then I will abridge the next, next story. So, so there is, you know, there is another story which, which can be said, which is actually continuing on the same, uh, same theme of, uh, using light sheet microscopy to answer biological questions in the area of tissue morphogenesis. And here we are focusing on the epiboly, uh, let's say, um, behavior of the tribolium uh, bl blastoderm during ga gastroation mor morph morphogenesis. What I would like to highlight here is that here light sheet microscopy really takes a central stage. We are able, we are, we are, we are, studying a very glo global morphogenetic process, which brings the cells from the top of the embryo all the way to the bottom of it, right? So in order to study it, image it and look at it from all its sides. This is very hard with three-dimensional image data, but you can do very easily if you, if you image with light sheet microscopy and you capture the entire uh, three-dimensional extent of the specimen, you can then use uh, cartographic projection to, to reduce the complexity of the three-dimensional image data and to project it into two dimensions. And so now we are seeing essentially, we, are, we, we have for the first time the ability to in one picture follow what happens on the top as well as the bottom part of the embryo. This, this makes uh, image analysis much, much easier. We are able to, because we are now essentially doing image analysis in two dimensions, so we are able to extract various measurements out of the 
out of the cell behaviors which these two-dimensional movies are exhibiting and project them onto these kind of cartographic maps and compare them and analyze them in in various ways and if we want to look at them in their you know full three-dimensional beauty we have the ability to essentially project them back into three dimensions and so to cut the long story short using this um using this uh, this kind of analysis we have been able to show that uh, that the that the blastoderm embryo during this epiboli movement is divided into two distinct zones the dorsal zone where cells expand homogeneously and don't change neighbors and the ventral zone where, where they when they change neighbors, which indicates that the, that the tissue in this area becomes regionally, let's say, more fluid-like, it becomes flu fluidized. And, and we have been able to explain that the fluidization is mediated by uh, enrichment of actomyosin at the closing uh, ventral side of the uh, spread ep ep epithelium. This is something I cannot really explain here because it would take, take, take a while. Uh, we come up with, with, with the model how the heterogeneity in the actomyosin dis distribution at the leading edge of this spreading epithelium is inducing the local tissue fluidization and how this local tissue flu flu fluidization helps the, the closure of the window. This is, uh, by, by, by the way, this mechanism is, is highly conserved. It is, uh, it is here shown in the context of normal development, but it has been also observed in the uh, context of uh, wound healing when you when you make a wound in the in the epithelium it also creates this kind of uh, heterogeneous actomyosin cable which fluidizes the, the the tissue locally and is able to close the wound so but but crucially light shear microscopy here was uh, really uh, enabling because it allowed us to look at this process in totality from from different uh, from from different angles and to really directly and quantitatively uh, uh, compare the cell behaviors in the completely opposing sides of the of the tribolium uh, uh, embryo something which this particular the spin microscopy is particularly good at giving you you can probably re realize it also with other microscopy technologies but here it comes essentially for free it is implicit that you have the ability to look at a large complex three-dimensional specimen from all its sides and therefore you can ask really global questions about the morphogenesis in such system and so so that you know means that the global spin up spin analysis allowed us to really show us that the, the local tissue fluidization could represent a conserved morphogenetic mechanism which is used in both development and homeostasis to close uh, epithelial gaps so um uh, I think I should basically essentially stop here. Um, I think that, you know, I didn't really completely close my point, which, uh, which essentially has been to, to, to say that, that the spin microscopy is, uh, is really um, absolutely, I'd say, uh, maybe I just go to some slide which can help me say something about it. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic te te technology which allows us to, to, to look at uh, tissue morphogenesis in various contexts outside of the classically studied uh, model organisms together with the ability to, to label the effectors of mor morphogenesis, we can really assess, access um, the morphogenetic events in essentially any species. And there is a lot to discover because, because the, the, the the principles of this technology have been really d d d demonstrated on uh, uh, on specimens which which are representing classical model species where where a lot is known, and so the technology has been pushed to its absolute limits to actually be able to discover something new. But now, if we take this technology and we apply it to systems which we don't know at all, which we haven't been really uh, able to even describe before by l l live imaging, we actually you know, gain enormous power because, because as Jan Husken says, it's very easy to build a spin microscope around almost any specimen. We are imaging these specimen in uh, aqueous environments where they are generally quite happy. 
we are very gentle on them so we are able to image them for a very very long 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 time we have the ability to image them very fast so that much faster than the how the developmental events are actually uh, unfurling and so we really have a possibility to bridge in one experiment decades of uh, of research it, it would take decades of research to gain the same amount of insights into cell behavior and morphogenesis in the new and unstudied model system using a light sheet ma microscopy and in fact you know what 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 i'm trying to actually show on this slide is that i think that that there is a you know new frontier where we could try to co com combine such dynamical data on really really a, a dynamic morpho morphogenetic processes such as ga gastroation which is shown here together with the very high resolution static data which are offered to us by the ultrastructural studies of electron microscopy down to 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 cryo em to to molecular level and also the the information which comes from looking at gene expression patterns of the the molecular underpinning of morphogenesis or at the level of the entire genome from the single cell omics but what I would like, what I would argue is that that the technologies such as light sheet mi microscopy and particularly SPIM really allows allow us to to use these kind of tools in a very unbiased manner across the tree tree of life on species which have not been studied before, and there is enormous potential for discovery here. So that I to say, I here and with uh, with uh, thank you slide, which where I thank the group of people who have been in my group at the time when we were doing this kind of stuff. And I just put a little um, advertisement here for uh, my new job at the Brno, at the Central European Institute of, of, of Technology, which is a little bit explaining why on my last slide I suddenly started talking about electron microscopy. Because Brno is a uh, capital of electron microscopy. Essentially, 35% of electron microscopes which you are using around the world are coming from Brno. They are really made there. I've seen the factory. It's absolutely mind mind blowing. And so in the future, we would like to really invest in the ability to combine the power of light sheet microscopy and my, my microscopy to do discovery in tissue morphogenesis. And sorry to that I time, but it is, you know, it is very hard. Thank you.